Guys, thank you all for coming out tonight and kind of sort of on a little bit of short notice. I got retrofitted and um, we'll be doing this tonight and also a week from tonight. The subject will be completely different. Next week, this time, we will be uh, tracking Joseph's and, and Mary's journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem for the birth. And we'll be using satellite imagery, so it'll be state of the art and very detailed. And we are going to travel the exact route that I'm 100% certain that they took, and we'll show you why that is next week. But we'll also, like we do in the United States, we'll be going by major locations. And whenever you drive by the Washington Monument, right, or the uh, president's um, pictures uh, on, the, uh, on the mountainside, that becomes the focus of discussion, right? And so when Joseph and Mary go, go past these incredibly important, biblically um, relevant locations, they will be having the discussion of what happened here and why is that relevant to the big picture story of what God's been doing, redeeming a people for himself throughout human history. Um, it's going to be a fun journey. I can guarantee you that. It's not something that you'll have read in a Sunday school quarterly, heard in a sermon, or heard it in some other teaching um, sort of session. Um, so I look forward to spending that time with you as well. Tonight, our topic is, what do we know about Christmas? Um, uh, probably better put, um, what, do we n what do we know that we probably shouldn't know? And what do we not know that we should know? I'll let you spend the next hour figuring out what I'm talking about uh, in that respect. But um, all you have to do is look at Christian art, and especially in different cultures. Um, I teach in Israel a lot, and almost all of my groups, we go to a church in Nazareth called the Church of the Annunciation. It's a modern church, 1964, built over top of crusader ruins that were built over top of Byzantine, that's late Roman period ru uh, ruins, that then basically go all the way back to the first century. There's a cave complex underneath, and at the, uh, the Church of the Annunciation marks the spot of the uh, announcement by the angel Gabriel to Mary that she is going to um, uh, give birth, conceive supernaturally, give birth supernaturally, and the child that she uh, gives birth to is going to be the Messiah. Okay, And in that church, there's a gigantic um, um, retaining wall that goes around the entire compound. It's the biggest worship, um, Christian worship center in the whole Middle East. And all around that, that, uh, the outside wall uh, are murals that are sent by different cultures around the world, and they look, if you compare France or Poland or England or Germany with Singapore and Japan and China, you're going to see a vastly different perspective on the Christ child and his mother Mary. They look so different, and they're reflecting their culture. So I put up here on the screen, uh, I'm not sure if I can do this. Let me see if I can duplicate. Uh, yes, okay. So on the, the side where the pointer is moving, you see that there is a cave and you have oil lit lamps and uh, the assortment of small animals around. And this is the context of Jesus' birth. On the other side, you see that there is a freestanding, uh, sort of a, not exactly a lean-to, but all, something approaching a barn. And here you have angels up above, not really possible in a cave. You have the star that's present there at the birth. You have all the obligatory animals. Yes, they can speak, but only one night a year, and that's at Christmas. At least that's what we're told, right? Um, so, very literate animals one night a week, one night a year. Uh, you have wise men bringing gift here, 
another one bringing a gift there, um, uh, another one bringing a gift here, but you also have shepherds and they're there together. Uh, those guys aren't there here, right? And no angels. And um, then you have the required, you know, like camels, because how else would a wise man get from Persia to Israel except with a Cadillac of the Middle East, the camel? All right, so these are two completely different ways that this is our culture. All this is built into our culture, and you see that different artists from coming from different maybe theological traditions and stuff like that are depicting this event in vastly different ways, right? Very different ways. So what we're going to do is we're going to dive into some of the details of the story, and we're going to try to sort out, um, if you want to call it, um, fact from fiction you know, myth from reality. Uh, the first thing that I want to uh, discuss tonight, and we just divide this up into topics, is um, uh, the timing of Jesus' birth. And, and the, the Gospel of Matthew um, starts us off with this, and he tells us, and we don't have to read every word of this, but basically he tells us that Herod, King Herod the Great, Herod the First, the founder of the Herodian dynasty, you get it here in verse 1, you get him mentioned again in verse 3, he's mentioned again by name in verse 7, again in by, by name in verse 12, verse 13, um, uh, at the end of verse 15, at the beginning of verse 16, Herod the Great is mentioned quite prominently in Matthew's version of this early story of Jesus' life. Um, what that means is Herod the Great is quite alive and kicking when Jesus is born, uh, when, he's, when he's a young child. Herod the Great. Herod the Great died in 4 BC. The spring, like uh, March, April of 4 BC. So if, if Herod was still alive, help me do the math here because I never did very well with math in school. It wasn't one of my strong suits. Uh, I didn't major in math. Praise God for biblical studies. Um, so 4 BC and Jesus is already born. What that means is that the year zero is an accident. Famous uh, paper that I got from a student at Evangel University back when I was on the full-time faculty before I retired um, started like this and I quote, in the year 0000, zero, zero, zero on December the 25th Jesus Christ was born of his parents, Joseph Christ and Mary Christ. It's kind of become a, last, a family name, a last name. I wanted to say thank you much, much, very much, Mr. Madison. We are all dumber for having heard you today, but I didn't want to go there for those who catch the, point, catch the reference. Um, but what that means is that this, uh, the idea that we have is that time is divided perfectly zero, 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 and anything before that is before the birth of Jesus and anything after that is like after the birth of Jesus doesn't really work well. I'll tell you one way that that uh, comes uh, into important play was back in the days of Y2K. Help me out here. Anybody remember Y2K? Some folks weren't born yet, that's okay. It's not your fault, you just got here late. Um, <laughs> But Y2K, I was asked to write an article uh, about um, Y2K, and it showed up, I think, in the Pentecostal Evangel or something like that. But basically, there was this big scare that when the, when the millennium turned over, that all of the computers were going to crash because they were not set to go any further than the year 2000, and that this was going to be the time when uh, Jesus returned and tribulation began on the earth and... There were just all kinds of dire predictions and that kind of thing. And so in the article, I wrote, um, so guys, the year 2000, according to the time of Jesus' actual birth, is actually somewhere around the year 2006 or 2007. We just missed the parties by six or seven years. So trust me, 
there's probably not going to be anything dire that's going to happen because, you know, this marks some major page that is turned over in human history um, based on the, the date of, of Jesus' birth. The, that party we missed, that happened six or seven years ago. So, uh, I don't mean to pop anybody's bubble or anything like that. Well, uh, some people liked that, some people took issue with it, but the bottom line was Y2K came and went and nothing happened. Come on, y'all. Help me out with this. You're still here, right? <laughs> Jesus didn't come back. If He did come back and you're still here, then you're the ones who are in a mess. Okay? And me too. Alright, so here the great is, uh, it dies in the spring of 4 B.C. That means that Jesus' birth, because Herod is alive and kicking when Jesus is born, uh, that means that Jesus has to have been born before Herod died. Matthew tells us that. If we have, according to ancient history, 4, B, uh, 4 B.C., spring of 4 B.C., um, and, and that's, that's a solid date, then Jesus' birth has to have been 5 B.C., 6 B.C., 7 B.C. Some scholars have suggested as early as 12 B.C. If then Jesus died in 33, he would have died at 45 years old. If, uh, at, um, 40, if, if he's 45 years old and the average age, the average lifespan of a Jewish male in the first century was 53, Jesus died as an old man, not as a young man in his prime. Um, in other words, for you old guys, uh, that would mean that Jesus, I'm not saying that that happened, I'm just saying these are possibilities. That would mean that Jesus went through, experienced the challenges of every major time period in our lives from infancy all the way to old age. That's an interesting thought. Okay, again, this is not your mother's home Bible study. I get that, uh, but work with me a little bit. Josephus says um, that on the very uh, uh, night there was an eclipse of the moon. Now, what is he talking about? Josephus is, Josephus is a first century Jewish historian who was born and raised in the land of Israel, was a contemporary, lived at the same time as the apostles, wrote in the same Greek as the New Testament, and was writing his works at the same time that our New Testament was being written. That makes him a pretty important source. Yeah? Okay. So, what is Josephus talking about in this big picture passage? Big picture of the passage is the death of Herod the Great. He says that uh, right before the death of Herod, there was an eclipse of the moon, and that that happened right around Passover time. So, we can date this because the, you know, astronomical, not astrological, astronomical data is, pretty, is very accurate, and we've got a good record of this. We can date this eclipse of the moon to March 13th, 4 B.C. So that would tell us again then that um, Herod the Great died in 4 B.C., in March, April of 4 B.C. Another reference to Josephus is he died having reigned 34 years, but since he had been declared by the king by the Romans, 37 years. It took him three years. This was not the nicest of guys. It took him three years to conquer his own people so he could rule over them. Go figure, right? Uh, the Gospel of Matthew says that when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, um, maybe a, um, a, a bad use of, of uh, choice of words there. Just maybe. Why? The Greek is magoi. But magi are fortune tellers. They're astrologers. They are um, pagan priests from Persia. Uh, these are people who are uh, non-Jewish, have no interest in the Jewish scriptures, no interest in the Jewish people. Um, and when they show up at the, um, uh, the home of Mary and Joseph, and they worship Jesus, there's some things that are really missing from that story. For example, they don't repent. They don't renounce their, you know, use of pagan um, and, and uh, black arts. So uh, there is a, a long tradition that goes back into the days of the post-exilic period. 
you know, um, after the Jews returned from Babylonian exile, of Jews who chose voluntarily to remain in Babylon to come to the land of Israel and inquire of um, uh, Jewish scholars living in the land of Israel about what should we do in this situation? What should we do about that? For example, um, we hear in our Bible at the end of the, of the Old Testament uh, that there are a, a, a number of representatives of this Jewish community. 90% stayed voluntarily in exile. Get that. Only about 10% based on the numbers that we get in 2 Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Only about 10% returned to the land of Israel when they had the chance. So um, that, that 90%. They are still mourning the uh, destruction of the temple, while at the same time in the land of Israel, they've rebuilt the temple and reinstituted animal sacrifice, and the priests are doing their jobs, and everything is clicking along like they're supposed to. So the guys in Babylon, they send representatives to the land of Israel, and they say, what should we do about this? We have a 70-year tradition now of on th that this time of year, we mourn the destruction of the temple, but uh, the temple's not destroyed anymore. We've got a, we've got a living, breathing, functioning temple here. Um, and so that continued through the intertestamental or between the testaments period and continued on into the time of um, Jesus, the New Testament, the apostles, uh, etc. And so I wrote a, um, a, a lengthy part of a book that has been gone through two different uh, editions um, in which I suggest that these people, instead of being pagan astrologers like so many different stories and preachers and teachers suggest that they're actually um, uh, high-ranking members of the Jewish community in Babylon who were sent by that Jewish community to discover, hey, what is this that has happened? What, what is the meaning of or the connection with this star that just appeared? And you go and find that out and bring that information back to us so that we then will know how to respond here in exile, here in um, Iran, Iraq area. Anyway, uh, trace the book down. It's in AGTS's library. It's in Evangel's library. Feel free to take a look at that if you're interested. And we're going to continue on. So. It says, when, when Herod saw that he'd been tricked by these people, the Magoi, the great ones, the, the exalted ones, then he became enraged. He went and he sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all of the area around from two years old and under according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. He had asked them, Where, when did the star appear? They told him, well, it was, it was just about two years ago. So... If, again, we're going from 4 B.C. when we know Herod was still alive and that's when he died, spring of 4 B.C., and we go two years backward, then we get a birth of Jesus at sometime around 6, 6 and a half, maybe 7 B.C. Um, so factor that into our previous comments on Y2K. Um, we have in Matthew that Jesus is, um, is, is about two years old. In the Gospel of Luke, we hear, in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields. I've, I've given you the Greek and I've also uh, written it out in English letters. Uh, agraluntes. You can get this part of it, can't you? We have words that come from this in English, right? Give me a couple of words that we have. Agriculture, agricultural. That sort of thing. Okay, and so there are two different kinds of land, and you and I know very well, being um, Missourians, that there's a certain kind of land that's very rocky and the soil is poor and stuff like that, and so you use it for uh, pasture land. Animals graze there, right? Then there are others, kind of bottom land, flat land, there's got deep uh, topsoil and is good for crops. Okay, well, the ancients knew that as well. And so they have two different words, one for area that is, you know, ag good for agriculture, the other that is uh, only appropriate for pasturage. This is the area where it's good for agriculture. So the question then is, why would shepherds be out in the fields at night 
And why would they be watching over their flocks? And why would their flocks be in agricultural areas and not in um, uh, pasture, typical pasturage? Good questions. Aren't those decent? Typically, if you train yourself to ask the right questions, you usually end up getting the right answers. That, that's what usually happens. This is kind of what is, folks, that you, you know, you're still in school or you were only recently uh, out of school. This is the scientific method. Ask the right question, get the right answer. So, um, there is a time period in the land of Israel still today where once a field has been harvested, then the farmers have this cooperative relationship with shepherds, uh, people who are practicing animal husbandry, and they invite them into the field. There, the, um, the herd animals will graze over the stubble. I'm using a biblical term there. The Bible uses that term for judgment, where everything is just wiped clean. Um, and so, uh, the field is at the same time cleansed of stalks and you know stuff that's not you know edible, leftover stuff, and there at the same time they are fertilizing the field. You know what goes in has to come out in another form, and that means that you're setting the farmer up with a clean field for the next growing season and a freely fertilized field, and that's good for everybody. So there's been this cooperative relationship um, with farmers and, um, and herdsmen for millennia in the, um, in the ancient Near East. This is probably what's going on here. The, uh, the final uh, harvest has taken place, and so the farmer has invited the, the uh, shepherds in, and they're giving free rent, but at the same time, they can't go over into somebody else's property, or there might be stacks of something that's off limits to these animals. So the shepherds have to keep a close eye on these animals so they don't go beyond the permission that has been set and begin to eat real animal stuff that are good for people, uh, get into somebody else's property and get in trouble. And so that's probably what's going on here. Well, when does that happen? That typically will happen between um, the middle of September and the middle of October. Because Israel's harvest um, cycle is not all that different from ours, you know. We're at pretty similar, you know, uh, north-south. Uh, and so that's, that, that relatively narrow window suggests then that uh, the um, birth of Jesus was taking place not in, on December the 25th, you know, like the, that famous paper that the student wrote, you know, in the year 0000, zero, zero, zero. Um, but rather probably more likely in the, uh, in the early fall. Um, that then leads a lot of people to suggest, okay, well then Jesus was born right around the festival of Sukkot or tabernacles or booths, sometimes it's called. Well, if Jesus came the first time at Sukkot or Tabernacles or Booths, it's also sometimes called the Festival of Trumpets. And Jesus says that the sound of the trumpet of God, um, then the dead in Christ will rise and will rise and meet him in the air and stuff like that. And so a lot of people have been doing the math kind of in the last 20 years or so uh, that, well, if Jesus came uh, the first time at Sukkot, Tabernacles, Booths, Trumpets, then he's going to have to come the second time at that same time of year. None of that really works, evidentially. There's not anything in the Bible that says that. Another thing is that, um, this, that, that, there, that there's a problem with date setting, which we know is not healthy for the body of Christ or for us individually, and that you know, we're supposed to avoid that. Well, these guys will say, the, the folks that want to run that approach, will say, well, we're not saying a specific day or hour. We're just saying a, a general time of year. And my problem with that is in uh, Acts chapter 1, uh, Jesus tells his disciples, no one knows the times or the seasons. The Father has set these by his own authority. And so it's not appropriate then for us to go looking under rocks and um, uh, crevasses to find little bits and pieces of evidence to cobble together an argument 
to determine the exact date or the exact hour or the general time of year or even year uh, that Jesus is to come. So then what do we do? Uh, what, what is our responsibility in terms of the, the return of Jesus? To be about the Father's business, to be watchful and sober, to be prayerful and to be fruitful, to be obedient, to be ready. Uh, not to have it all figured out, but to be ready whenever that happens. And we've got parables and all kinds of stuff that teach that. Uh, so I'll let you study up on that on your own. Um, feel free to do that. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch our videos. If you're benefiting from the content that you're receiving from them, please make sure that you're following us on Facebook and that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so you never miss a thing. While you're at it, share our content with your friends and family. Encourage them to follow us as well. Thanks for helping us to reach as many as we can with a powerful message of God's Word in its original context.